You are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. I think that the commanders realized that the undertaking of invading the continent of Europe across the English Channel was extremely high risk. You will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. The Germans had significant forces in Western Europe, about 58 divisions available, and they had also had a lot of time to prepare defenses and had put defenses, pillboxes, machine gun nests, artillery pieces, all up and down the coast in the primary locations where they thought that we would invade. And so it was going to be a hard nut to crack. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. D-Day, the Allied landing at Normandy that changed the direction of World War II. This is the story of the unknown heroes of T-Day, a special forces unit called the Jedbergs, three-man teams of one American, one British, one French operator. Their mission? Parachute into occupied France to conduct unconventional warfare deep behind enemy lines to disrupt German communication and transportation networks. I'm Fran Ricciopi, Green Beret and host of the Jedberg Podcast. This is the story of the Jedbergs, a little known force that parachuted into occupied France the night before D-Day to arm and equip the French resistance against a superior German force. The mission was to disrupt German operations in the rear area in order to further disrupt activities that would be in support of pr trying to prevent the success of Operation Overlord, of course, which is the invasion at Normandy. Operation Jedberg was a multinational special operation effort to aid the French resistance and create the, the mechanism by which they could complicate the German uh, ability to reinforce the beaches. So that was their mission, was to try to continue to disrupt what was going on, create distractions. The leadership came to the conclusion that they needed to expand the battlefield beyond just the beachhead. They needed a means to create multiple dilemmas for the Germans, to make their challenge harder than it was. Because if we fought it on the beaches, the Germans were prepared for that fight. They thought we were going to come in at Pas de Calais, and there was a good deception plan that kind of feed that notion, and then we went to Normandy instead. The ability to empower the resistance gave us an opportunity to expand the battlefield and fight across the rear area of the Germans and complicate their ability to provide reinforcements at whatever beach we landed at. The Germans actually went in and they brutalized the population. They would burn farms. They would kill farmers just out of course. And they would actually take villagers and they would go into some area and just have an execution. So the Germans were very brutal against the partisans and the resistance. The skills that the Jeds brought, their language skills, most of those guys had lived in foreign cultures before. They'd lived in Europe. They knew how to get around. They spoke the language. They understood the culture. They understood nuances. The Jedbergs were three men. Usually there was some American on it, but not always. It was composed of two officers and one wireless operator. And the composition was French, British, and American. Teamwork was so important. It was important then, it's been important ever since, and it's just as important today. Because when you're in there working, the Jedbergs, as well as Special Forces today, are designed to work with host nation forces. And so they're not out there conducting those operations in those three-man teams. They were working in France, uh, working with the French resistance, in order to expand their operational capabilities. And so it's not just three men on the ground, it was three men on the ground working with a larger resistance force in order to provide the maximum effects. So, that force multiplier effect that they bring, that Special Forces brings today, 
you know, teamwork is, is absolutely critical in that. Regardless of background, they were looking for complex problem solvers. People who were confident, who could look at a, at a challenge and not be overawed by it, who were willing to take risks in a calculated way, and who were not averse to the idea of taking on what is really an incredibly dangerous mission. We want you to be ready to parachute into enemy-held territory, link up with a foreign group of civilians who have turned resistance fighters that you don't know, maybe can't fully trust, and then with not a lot of help or direction from higher, figure out how to accomplish a really hard problem under really hard conditions that has huge significance for the nation. It's essentially what we ask special operators to do today in many cases around the world. My grandmother was actually in Normandy on D-Day. Uh, she was 19 years old, six months pregnant, uh, living in a small Norman village. Um, and uh, she was there with her family. And uh, she, she experienced German occupation, Nazi occupation of France for the, for the duration of the war. Uh, very, very difficult times. Uh, she talks at length about the elements of the resistance that were constantly disrupting and frustrating the Germans. She got to see it firsthand. So she, I think I heard from her growing up what, what those Jedburg operations and the resistance operations could do to really foment disarray and disruption uh, behind enemy lines because she lived it. Um, now, because she was pregnant, she never got personally involved. Uh, thankfully, that's why I'm here today because my mother was born and then, you know, I came along later. Uh, but a very personal connection there that, that really linked back to being in occupied France uh, and seeing firsthand the importance of resistance activities. And then sure enough, living through D-Day, going to bed at night with bombs and airplanes flying overhead, hiding out in the basement of, uh, of her house, and waking up the next day to a knock on the door, uh, and it was an American officer that had just liberated her village from German occupation. So I've got a I've got a very personal connection to uh, German occupation resistance movements and D-Day in particular. Uh, and I'm pretty excited because I'm, I'm going out to France. She's still alive and she turns 100 uh, this August. So I'm gonna go out there and uh, celebrate her 100th birthday in Normandy. Yeah, pretty cool. This program is brought to you by the Green Beret Foundation. target, on deck, on point, D-Day, June 6th, 1944, two million acts of courage, of sacrifice, Heritage Distilling Company is proud to partner with the Green Beret Foundation and sponsor Unknown Heroes, behind enemy lines at D-Day. The way I would characterize Operation Jedburgh in the context of the wider D-Day invasion of the European theater uh, would be a shaping effort to foment resistance behind enemy lines, to create disruption, to even degrade some of the logistical capabilities of the enemy, turn their attention away from the main effort, and create opportunities for a larger invading force to seize the initiative at a time and place of our choosing. General Eisenhower was concerned that parachuting all of these elements across France would tip that the invasion was coming. We didn't get the first teams in until one night before D-Day and then on subsequent nights after that. They were to parachute in link up with known resistance elements, and then create havoc. They did sabotage. They did hit and run. But their main purpose was to laze with the resistance and to get them supplied. If you cannot operate as a team collectively in that small of an element in hostile territory, you won't accomplish your mission. You rely on each other for specific skills and capabilities, and you just have to have that complete trust that if somebody says they're going to execute 
a capability or a mission, they follow through with that. It was a dangerous proposition going behind enemy lines, particularly in an area that the Germans had occupied for so long. They had their own network of agents and informers. And so this issue of trust was always a risk to be taken of, can I trust this French man or woman who is taking me from point A to point B or giving me housing? It was high risk adventure. They had to be able to know that they would go into a place and they could easily change their dialects or understand what was going on when they met up with the resistance. So not only do you benefit from interacting with those elements and exploiting, taking advantage of, I don't mean exploiting in a negative way, but exploiting in a positive way all of the advantages that they bring to bear, they also serve as a force multiplier. Gaining the trust of the French resistance really in uh, any kind of operation where you're working with uh, an indigenous element in these kind of conditions is probably the, the first hard problem that the Jedbergs faced. Soon after the initial invasion, there were hundreds of airdrops of supplies. I think the estimate is something like 3,400 tons of equipment was brought in to fight and, and wage warfare in the rear area of the German lines. And this is everything from communications gear to small arms, ammunition, demolitions, etc. Over a period of time, there was about 80 Jedburg teams that were dropped in all together between June and September of 1944. The French resistance, aided by Operation Jedburg, were intended to be the, the sand in the, in the gears, if you will, and, and slow things down. And the estimates are that it was very effective. Some of the divisions that were intended to reinforce at Normandy were delayed by two days. Not a lot, but still significant if it's the right two days. Uh, but many of them up to two weeks. So, so it took somewhere between two days and two weeks for the Germans to get units to Normandy in order to stop the invasion at the beachhead. And in that time, of course, the Allies were able to bring capability over the beach, build on the beachhead they created on the 6th of June, and continually expand. And so it was pretty significant from a strategic perspective in making sure that the initial lodgement on Normandy Beach was successful. I wasn't aware of the Jetbirds before the war, but I heard of them after the war. And if it wasn't for them, I think we would probably still be fighting the war. They paved the way for us to come into France. I was 18 when I was inducted in the Army, and I think it was uh, 19 when I went overseas. I don't remember how I felt inside, but I wasn't worried, I, I wasn't scared. It was just something we had to do, I guess. The only thing I didn't like was the ride over on the English Channel. It was real rough. <laughs> The Jetbirds did pave a way to the victory by cutting communication lines and disrupting some of their equipment. I'm glad we did go over there and fight the Germans and, and the enemy. I know I wasn't a big help, but I was one of nine million people that were there to uh, destroy Hitler and his Nazi regime. For the millions of patriotic, hard-working people who count on their tools to build their slice of the American dream, there's a new standard of elite performance that's changing everything. Forged with the world's toughest materials and built to outperform in the most unforgiving conditions. Spec Ops. Elite performance. Uncommon duty. Ever notice that the best advice usually involves some sort of decisive action? Take on the world. Seize the day. Grab life by the horns. Maybe it's because the guys who say things worth listening to aren't the type to humbly accept whatever life hands them. Instead, they choose to craft reality with their own hands. There's a pride in doing that that some folks don't or won't understand. 
but if you do, if you're one of those types who knows the satisfaction of solving your own problems and of being well prepared and well equipped, then you're one of us. And you're among good company. At CRKT, we work alongside the most innovative designers in the world, people who share our passion for purpose to consistently deliver the tools and knives that shape the industry. We're proud to be an American company. We were born in Oregon, so naturally our products tend to take after the place we've called home for the past 20 years. At first glance, it's all jaw-dropping, eye-popping beauty. But get up close and you'll realize there's another side, the business side. The don't you ever underestimate me side. It's why guys who choose CRKT knives and tools can, frankly, be a little particular about them. They know that there's just something right about holding the perfect tool in your hands. And once you've felt that connection, it's hard to accept anything less. It really can't be understated the value of their effort. A small number, rel relatively small number, 300 or less uh, uh, of these Jedbergs and, and other OSS and SOE members on the ground in France, but facilitated really a strategic effect by creating a major challenge for the Germans in their rear area and the ability to execute their plan to defend the beaches. Eisenhower actually said the support that they gave the Allied push was equal to 15 military divisions. From a operational to strategic level, their significance and effectiveness was very high, meaning that any type of sabotage or subversion that they were able to uh, execute during those times, it had significant and, and uh, considerable psychological effect on the adversary. The Jedbergs, who were the genesis of us sitting here today, were so effective that we felt it important enough to coalesce around that and build the, the Green Berets. You know, it, had it not been for their success, we wouldn't be sitting here today talking about what it is we're talking about or doing the things that we're doing. The lineage of the Jedbergs today is alive and well in the pipeline of a Special Forces Green Beret in the Army. They continue to demonstrate grit and perseverance under significant stress in uncertain environments. They develop regional and language expertise to be able to partner locally and develop what we call now generational relationships because we've been doing this in some cases generations uh, uh, at a time. And I think the ability to work as a team still remains absolutely critical, much like it did in those early days of the Jedbergs. If you look at the Jedbergs, like the composition of them, it's kind of fitting as we move forward of working with partners and allies in the traditional soft missions. So you had um, basically a composite of Americans, British and French soldiers, of which a commander, a commo guy, but very small teams represented by all three nations. The ability to come together, solve problems, so realizing that you know one person can solve a problem, but three or four people or 12 people can solve a problem much more effectively when you, you look at the, the problem through a different perspective and you put all your skills to bear on the problem to work together. Uh, so I think that's, uh, that's, that's fundamentally where you draw a lot of the, um, the lineage back to the Jedbergs that still is alive uh, today in the, uh, in the Green Berets. Colonel Aaron Bank is widely considered to be the father of, of, of modern day Green Berets of the Army Special Forces. Colonel Bank was one of the original members of the OSS. He was a Jedberg that parachuted into France and then was transferred to the Pacific Theater and parachuted in on an operation out in the Pacific. The Office of Strategic Services, more commonly known in our acronym LADEN community as the OSS, was the predecessor to both the Central Intelligence Agency of today and really any sort of sensitive or special activities capabilities within the, within the military. 
and really the brainchild of Wild Bill Donovan. And he envisioned a clandestine service that could do everything from intelligence collection with deep covered agents who were literally living you know, double lives through really special action teams. They had civil affairs, they had psychological operations. It ran the whole gamut of all of the stuff really that, that we consider modern day special operations, really with the exception of a large scale raiding capability. All right, come on, let's go. The mission, it's changed, you know, warfare, we've modernized, but I think for SOF and, and Special Forces and Green Berets, it hasn't really changed all too much, right? We're still working by, with, and through partners and allies for, for an end state. We spend a lot of time as students come here through the qualification course of kind of baselining them and onboarding them to who we are as, as a regiment in our history. So uh, students come here and part of their onboarding and inception here at SWIC is a walk through this museum so that they're kind of learning a little bit about their own history and lineage and the regiment that they're joining. Um, so they'll, they'll come through here, they'll learn about the OSS, the First Special Service Force of the Devil's Brigade. And they kind of tie that as you walk through the museum of all the, where we've started and where, where we've come from and where we're going. Post-World War II, it was the first time afterwards with the establishment of Special Forces, seeing the effectiveness and then creating a standing irregular, unconventional capability was the first time within U.S. history that we had done that. They were capabilities that were always stood up during times of conflict, and eventually they saw that, hey, this is a need that we need to nurture, and we need to create and train in peacetime so that we're prepared to do it in wartime. And that was, I think, directly related to the effectiveness of the, of the OSS and the Jed Burks. We spent a lot of time and money and effort on, on developing these robust, rigorous scenarios that really test the individual, not just on their skills that we've given you, but on their ability to operate, you know, as a functional, well-rounded, robust, you know, human being um, in a dynamic environment, because that's the key to our success. We all know it takes a while for training to catch up with the, the changes on the modern battlefield. That's one of the things that we talk about a lot is how the modern battlefield and operating environment has changed and the, the challenges we have in it. And we've got to respect the fact that, okay, there, there are a lot of things that we're gonna to have to do differently just because of the way, the way the world is today. Special thanks to our sponsors, Spec Ops Tools, Excalibur Industries, Heritage Distilling Company, and CRKT. Military challenge coins are given in recognition of excellence, but also to signify affiliation to a unit or an organization. Every episode of the Jedberg Podcast, I present our guests with their own Jedberg Podcast coin, welcoming them to our Jedberg team. In honor of the 80th anniversary of D-Day, the Jedberg Media Channel and the Green Beret Foundation launched a commemorative limited edition D-Day coin. Purchase of this coin gets you on our Jedberg team, and as you know, Jedbergs led the way behind enemy lines on D-Day, conducting sabotage and subversion operations to allow the conventional force to gain the beachhead. Proceeds of the coin support our Jedberg Media Channel D-Day coverage and our D-Day documentary, Unknown Heroes, Behind Enemy Lines at D-Day, the story of Operation Jedberg. Get your coin today, support the Jedberg Media Channel and the Green Beret Foundation, and join our D-Day Jedberg team. We'll see you in Normandy. The Jedberg teams, the operational groups, and the OSS played a pivotal role in the success of the Allies in World War II. Their legacy forms the foundation of today's Army Special Forces. I'm Fran Ricciopi. Thanks for watching. This program is brought to you by the Green Beret Foundation.